Well, one of the things I love that you say with your content is like, yeah, yes, we need the science. We need to do these studies. We're forgetting wisdom. We're forgetting the things that we knew generationally and passed down that are regional, that are, you know, we didn't move around and travel as, around as much as, as we do today. And so we lose the, the, the feeling of the cycle of the seasons and what grows. And if this goes bad, how can we fix it using natural solutions? And so again, there's so much nuance to it. Yeah, and I, I see that mostly that the point of like wisdom, we mostly see that in agriculture, right? In farmers, farmers are doing things that, okay, they see, okay, if I do this, my uh, forages are better, my pasture are better, my animals are healthier, right? When they maybe use regenerative practices or what's called regenerative agriculture, it's a hard term. And I usually say agroecology, but then people go agro what? It basically means like sort of nature-based solutions to farming. Uh, but regenerative agriculture is the same thing. Yeah. It's trying to make things better than, uh, than your left them. Um, what you see it there is that a lot of times we, you know, we may not have a lot of evidence currently on uh, like how soil health impacts forage quality, animal health, but farmers know this from what they do and it's called wisdom and they may not always have scientific studies to prove it, but it doesn't mean that we should then discard it. And I think sometimes I mean, of course, in policy, it's important that we focus on scientific studies, but there's also almost so much we can do in science. And usually uh, it's, it's interesting that, uh, yeah, we can kind of sort of ignore that wisdom, also indigenous wisdom and things yeah. like that, like managing the land and, and doing a good job. And we may not always have the studies and we don't exactly know how it works, but yeah, if you have better, you know, you're making improvements in your soil, then yeah, your plants grow better, the animals yeah. healthier. You might not have the studies to prove it yeah. per se, but everyone can see it. It's like, uh, yeah, we don't, you know, if I uh, ask you what, what's the color of the sky? Well, at the moment it's white because it's snowing, but it's, it's blue, right? Yeah. And then I, I would ask you then, well, why is the scientific evidence that it's blue? Yeah. You, don't, you don't need it, it's common sense. Yes, exactly. And it used to, some of these things used to be common sense, but um, we sometimes forget common sense yeah. a little bit. Yeah, so I bought a quarter cow from a rancher um, a few months ago. And I, I really had to twist his arm, but I got him to come on our show. And he's, he admits he's not an expert in human nutrition. He's not an expert in you know ethics. He's not an expert in planetary health, but it was a nice opportunity for me just to ask anecdotally, like, what do you think about these things? Like, do you think your family is happy? They're eating cream and cows and like, they seem like they're really energetic and well-behaved and like what he thought about ethics and whether, you know, his, his ranch was destroying the, you know, atmosphere around him that can probably hardly breathe with all the cows around. And, and it was interesting to hear, you know, that, that he had wisdom. He knew that land. He knew all of those things that you talked about more than you and I, if we went and, and, you know, just visited for a few days. And he said that he kept a journal with all the weather patterns every single year and just kind of wrote like on this day, it snowed for the first time and he keeps it all year round. And I just, I, I told him this and I, I really believe this. If I took that journal away, I'll bet he would be fine. I'll bet he would still know all of those things because that is somebody who's in that environment, in that atmosphere and learning all the time. Yeah, absolutely. And it, the farmer did that because he was forced or to do that because he knew it would improve his business. If he had done that as part of a PhD, then it would have been considered science. Huh? So, <laughs> there you go. So it's also important to note. And uh, it's good to your point because we do a lot of field work at, at farms over the grazing season and uh, this is a lot of uh, uh, local farmers, but I've also been in North, the, uh, North Dakota this past year. In the past, uh, when I was at Duke University, we had a lot of work with uh, farms in the Southeast, North Carolina, Alabama. And visiting these farms and collecting forages, collecting soil, getting their meat and testing it. You know, when I stand there and listening to the farmer, and I always learn so much from farmers, is that um, I stand there and, and, and look around and there's this beautiful biodiversity, flowers, uh, very high native grasses. I mean, it just looks like a beautiful ecosystem. I cannot, you know, and these are grass-fed beef systems. I cannot help but thinking that we're not destroying the earth that way. And that's something I grapple with too, because if I then go back to my office and, and look at scientific studies on, on grass-fed beef, then I can convince myself it's the absolute worst thing for the environment mm. because of the emissions, right? Yeah. Um, now not to go to not too far down a rabbit hole because you know if we don't often take into account carbon sequestration potential uh improves soil health biodiversity that could be uh also especially for small small herbivores um but that is one thing that we often do don't take into account so we have like the sort of simplified narrative we have to focus on emissions yeah i can stand there and i'm thinking like okay we're destroying the earth there yeah if, at least if i have a scientific paper next to it but then with my own eyes i'm thinking like hmm you know, grapple with this because yeah. 
it does seem like there's improvements in biodiversity. The land has been uh, uh, improving over time. There's a farmer we go up uh, a couple of years in a row now up in Idaho. His name is Brad Alzinga and he grazes public rangelands. And uh, I mean, he does a great job because he hurts his animals. And I think it's definitely also the way management practices are so important. Like what some farmers do is they let the cows out over the grazing season and they get them back again in October and check up on them from time to time. But he does, he hurts them on uh, horseback. So he does sort of the, the migratory patterns that that's maybe the traditional bison had, right? Wow. Like they were always on the move. They graze, and especially out west, and this is also if you read all the writings about bison, bison would sometimes graze uh, here at the Western rangeland. They would graze a certain spot once every two years, once every three years. And that's kind of what he's doing too. He grazes a spot for a few minutes every two to three years. Wow. And it just keeps them uh, uh, on the move. And it's, it's quite impressive because you'd stand there talking to him. And then uh, a couple of minutes later, you're like, where, where the hell did the cows go? <laughs> and they were just already like, you know, wow, up, uh, moves further. So, so it's definitely also important uh, to, to realize that. But yeah, I mean, I do, I can understand the concerns, of course, also, because I think historically we have done uh, a bad job in, in, in managing the lands. And of course, we, you know, there used to be a lot of land. We thought we sort of the infinite resources. Yeah. Turns out they're quite finite, with, yeah. uh, as we are learning now with the water drying up and, and you know, uh, dwindling forages, monocultures, even here on Western Rangelands. If you look, then you think like, oh, not, how can we ever mess this up? There's so much land. Yeah. Well, we, we can't. We can't. So, so that's also an important uh, uh, part to, uh, to note. And uh, yeah, I mean, what we typically see though in, in that work is that, yeah, farmers that do more of these regenerative practices, rotational grazing, not overgrazing, leasing biodiverse forages, yeah, the, the animals are healthy and the meat is more nutrient dense. Yeah. That's amazing. Okay, so on that note, something you mentioned earlier, I really wanted to talk about the difference between us consuming some of the plants that we consume versus running them through animals who are arguably better at using them and taking them and then us eating the animal to get those nutrients. Is there much of a difference there? Can, can, can animals bioaccumulate lots of nutrients that then we can absorb? Yes, absolutely. They can absorb, they can bioaccumulate nutrients from plants that we can then absorb. Absolutely. And uh, what is interesting about animals is that animals can consume vegetation that you and I cannot consume, right? It might be uh, because we don't have the ability to digest that, we cannot digest grasses, but also certain forbs and shrubs that we know maybe contain some medicinal terpenes, but it also contains phytotoxins. So we might try to eat that plant and uh, we get a horrible stomach ache. Yeah. So there's, it's, it's a, we could not uh, obtain those nutrients otherwise. So we get some, some unique nutrients that we would otherwise have not have access to. So it's a way of further increasing the phytochemical origins, but I should uh, preface this by saying this, is that fruits and vegetables are the primary source of phytochemicals in our diet. Uh, getting your beta carotene from a carrot, as opposed to grass-fed beef, getting it from a carrot is a much better idea than mm. from the grass-fed beef. Gotcha. Even though you can find beta carotene in grass-fed beef. Um, but beef can contain certain nutrients that would otherwise be hard to get for us and things that we would otherwise not uh, readily uh, consume. We found certain terpenes, certain uh, polyphenols that uh, uh, you would otherwise not be able to, to get in readily amounts in, in your diet. So it's certainly another way of getting some more unique compounds in our diet and further increasing the phytochemical richness. 